Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another installment of our Lunch and Learn uh, webinar series hosted by Zach's. I'm your host today, uh, Meyer Thacker. I am the Senior Relationship Manager here at Zach's, working on our institutional services side. And today's topic is going to be something that we hear a lot lately in the financial media. Uh, through throughout Bloomberg, throughout CNBC, and other online uh, media outlets within the financial services world. Uh, lots and lots of companies that are now coming public at earlier and earlier stages in their life. And many of them, um, if not you know, the vast majority of them, are still you know, unprofitable. And some of them are even you know, before the stage of earning revenue. And that's what we've been seeing uh, so far, you know, throughout 2020 is a record number of companies coming public um, without even having revenues to show for. So, you know, those types of companies require a lot of mostly qualitative analysis. So what we're going to focus on for today are the, the companies that are unprofitable, but have financial uh, underlying financial trends that we can analyze to be able to pick potential winners uh, in that space. So the first thing that you know I'd like to talk about is you know what is what are some of the tools that we can use within Zacks to understand you know which companies although unprofitable currently have the potential to generate profit and there are three keys that I've I've outlined here, and the first one is the most obvious one, and this is something everybody knows. Um, the first thing that we want to see for these companies is evidence of revenue growth, and that shows basically whether the following, you know, two critical trends are actually occurring. One is is the company experiencing increasing market adoption, right? Are the products in demand? Um, and number two, is it is that revenue growth is a signal of a vote of confidence in the company's value added. And there's you know, really two ways you can do that, either through providing a quality service or product or providing a cheaper service or product. So um, however, there are a number of different ways you can look at revenue growth. Some people look at revenue growth in terms of quarter over quarter. They look at it in terms of quarter over same quarter one year ago. Um, they look at it in terms of year over year. So how would you look at revenue growth? And really, there's no simple example or solution to as a one size fits all for all companies. But one thing that we have in the Zacks research system that makes it very easy, and I believe uh, the best approach, is to look at growth rates in least squares terms. And that means that that's basically looking at the slope of the regression line over a longer period of time. Most people look at growth rates in terms of Kager, um, which just looks at the beginning and ending uh, values and using um, an exponent to understand what is the compounded growth rate. But the problem with that analysis is that it only looks at the beginning and ending and ignores the middle part of it. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute here and see what you know, why there is a difference between the two and why I think least squares growth is the best way to look at growth in general. So number one and first and foremost is, you know, when we look at unprofitable companies, um, in order for, you know, them to have a pathway to profitability, the most obvious thing that they need is revenue growth. Um, but the value added here, um, in, addition, in addition to stating the obvious, is how should one measure such revenue growth. And we'll, we're going to look at that in terms of least squares growth rates within ZRS. Uh, the second key to um, you know, picking winners within unprofitable companies is that we need to see some evidence of operating leverage. And this is important because you know, without operating leverage, you don't really have a business that's scalable. And how do we measure that? Right. How do we understand it, whether there is operating leverage in the company or not? The simplest way to do it is to look at uh, revenue growth and compare that to any number of 
profit items that occur below re the revenue line item on the income statement. So depending on the stage of the company, some companies are very early stage and some companies are you know, several years in. So depending on what stage that the company is in, it would be either gross profit for really early stage companies or EBITDA or EBIT for later stage companies and then non-GAAP adjusted net income um, for even further you know, companies that are even further along. And what we wanna see here is the growth rate of any of these four items or even other items too, not just limited to this, but it could be um, you know, cash flow or free cash flow or even other analytically adjusted numbers. Um, but we wanna see that number grow faster than revenue growth. And so what does that mean? It's basically telling you that the company has high fixed costs, which means that if they continue to scale revenue, that they can one day hit an inflection point such that their total revenue can then exceed total costs. And therefore any growth that they experience at that point going forward would then flow straight to the bottom line and flip the company from unprofitability to profitability. So the way that we can understand whether this exists or not is to basically look for any one of these four items or perhaps other items that are growing faster than revenue growth. So the key question here is that, is the business scalable, right? Can they grow revenue? But then also is some other line item below revenue growth growing faster than that revenue growth. So that's what we want to see as a, as a potential sign that there is operating leverage within the company. And then lastly, and this is something that I think is well overlooked, unfortunately, it's not spoken about or discussed often enough. Um, I, you know, I watch CNBC and Bloomberg, uh, you know, religiously, and I just don't see enough investors talking about this but I think it should be at this at the center point of any conversation for any any long term investor, because ultimately growth is great and operating leverage is great. But what if the company requires lots and lots of capital spending to achieve that growth? Then in that case, you may have a, a case where there's really attractive revenue growth and the presence of operating leverage which means that the company can actually become profitable. But what if they have very poor or declining returns on assets? Um, that means that there's a lot of spending that's needed on an ongoing basis to achieve that revenue growth and to achieve profitability. And if that's the case, then it's a very poor investment because the company is not earning a return on its capital that is attractive and that's better than what investors can earn you know, elsewhere. So the way that you can calculate this, especially for companies that are very early stage is, you know, the traditional calculation is net income over total assets, um, but it can vary for very early stage and high growth companies. So the return on assets can be you know, done in a number of different ways, and it should be done on a case by case basis for the company that you're looking at. So just like what we saw in the earlier slide, depending on the stage of the company, maybe it's gross profit that you wanna see that's growing faster than revenue. Or if they're further along, then maybe it's adjusted non-GAAP net income that is growing faster than revenue growth. So again, the same principle applies here. There can be a number of different ways that you can look at you know, whether there is increasing returns on assets. And it can be just simply asset turnover, which is just looking at revenue growth uh, or sales over assets and just look at the, the change in that number over time. Or you can go further along and look at gross profit over assets, EBITDA over assets, EBIT over assets, or non-GAAP adjusted net income over assets. So it doesn't have to necessarily be positive. Right. So even if you get down to this non gap adjusted net income line, even if that number is negative, we just want to see whether it's trending in the right direction. So, again, these are for companies that are unprofitable currently, 
but are experiencing high levels of growth, right? So what we want to see is evidence that there is a march higher in the return on assets that the company is generating. So again, why is this important? It's important because it's identifying whether a company is compounding its total capital. So that includes any externally provided capital from stakeholders, such as um, you know, equity that they've raised, plus any um, you know, debt that they've raised, plus any internally available capital. And you wanna see them earning a return that's at a higher rate than what investors can earn elsewhere themselves. So this is a key point to be picking winners. So we're gonna look at a couple of examples of each of these three principles using ZRS. And we're gonna look at four particular case studies, um, Amazon, Tesla, Uber, and Snowflake. And all of these companies, all four of these companies have been um, very, very much unprofitable um, at different points in their lifetime especially Amazon in their early years. But we're gonna see um, what analytical adjustments we can make within ZRS to really understand what is the right number to be looking at that's specific to that you know, company. So first we'll start with Amazon, the classic example of a company that once was unprofitable, but since then has become enormously unprofitable. So we'll go back you know, into ZRS here, and I'm just gonna type in Amazon as the main ticker symbol. And as an example, I'm just gonna show you exactly what they were doing you know, early on. If we go to their gap earnings per share, and I'm gonna go under you know, charts, fundamental history, under per share items, we have these different measures of per share numbers, and I'm just gonna pick EPS gap. And for Amazon, you can see for many, many years, especially right out of the gate after they went public back in 1997 or you know 1996, um, you can see that they were really bleeding money um, on a gap earnings per share basis, and it went all the way down to about four, almost you know four dollars a share, which in those days was considered a lot. And even from that low point, they did have a recovery. But you can see that they've been since teetering between profit and loss on a gap basis. You know, profit and loss, profit and loss. And even in recent times, you know, within the post great financial crisis era, you know, they dipped back below zero into uh, gap losses. As recently as 2015, Amazon posted a gap earnings per share loss. And then suddenly something changed, and we, you know, we know, we all know what that was. Um, you know, if you've been following Amazon, of course, they've been involved in the retail side for, you know, since inception. But really, since 2015, that's when AWS has kicked in, and that's where the software revenues have really started to shine. And you can see that's when gap earnings per share finally went positive and never looked back ever since. But you know, the stock, if you looked at it has been rising all throughout this entire period. If we were, were to wait until 2015, most of those gains would have already been realized despite the fact that gap earnings per share were indicating you know, a, a sideways stock. And there were many skeptics that looked at this and said, you know, Amazon isn't making any money. Why is the stock you know, soaring? You know, the stock is terribly overvalued. And even up till 2015, that was the case. So what is it about Amazon then? So the key as an analyst is to understand if it's not gap earnings that the stock is soaring on, is there something else? There's something else besides earnings per share on a gap basis that the stock is correlating to. And we have a couple of tools within uh, ZRS to help you understand that. And I'm gonna go under this relative price, relative fundamental section. And if I go to size here and I you know, look at for example, free cash flow, right? And that's another metric that, you know, I think I would say is just as important, if not more important than gap earnings per share. Um, if we go to this number here, look at the look at the relationship here. And we, we see two items on this chart. We see the stock price and we see free cash flow on a trailing 12-month basis. 
And we see the number has, again, teetered between gains and losses, just like Gap, but you can see that the growth in the number has correlated very, very closely with the stock price. And you can see that right here. And now you can see exactly since then how closely the two correlate with one another um, on a free cash flow basis. You can see a little bit better if we go to, um, you know, back to that relative price section and go to EBITDA. And again, this is the same exact, uh, you know, principle happening is that although gap was basically uh, sideways to negative, we see increasing evidence of EBITDA growth. And EBITDA was was negative at one point, but at you know since very very early on, you can see that it flipped positive um, at the turn of the century, right? In uh, early 2000, 2001 is when it flipped positive and never looked back. So EBITDA, you can think of it as a forward-looking indicator or a leading indicator um, of you know earnings per share. So clearly, investors were focused on something other than earnings per share, um, and in this case, it was EBITDA and, to a slightly lesser degree, free cash flow. So we see that growth rate here, right? Um, what else do we see? Do we see operating leverage? We can check that out as well. If I were to go back to um, revenue growth and just take a look at that, now we know what you know revenue growth they've been achieving recently, but let's go back to when they were actually unprofitable on a gap basis. So I'm going to change our history here, and I'm just going to say um, you know from January 1st, 1997 to January 1st, 2007. So basically during that entire time period when they were actually earning um, negative earnings per share on a gap basis, and you can see that revenue growth, and this is what I was talking about earlier is this is uh, my personal favorite way of understanding growth rates is to instead of looking at year over year numbers or even looking at quarter over quarter numbers um, i like to look at a chart of a longer period of time and use this uh, trend line right here and this comes up here um, by right clicking on the chart and clicking on regression line so this regression line basically runs a linear regression um, on a log scale. So you can see that the Y scale is a log basis. So it's a linear regression with the Y scale turned into a logarithmic format. So essentially you're capturing any exponential growth using a linear uh, regression line. So now we can see this number and you can see the slope of that regression line is 59%, 59.38%. So that tells me that over this, you know, 10 year time period post IPO, Amazon generated annualized revenue growth of almost 60%. So that was phenomenal, right? Now, do we see evidence of operating leverage? We can check out various different line items underneath revenue, such as EBITDA or EBIT um, or non-GAAP net income. Um, or you know free cash flow, and you can see a number. If I were to type in so like free cash flow here, you can see that free cash flow, although it had a, a dip, you know during that you know dot com bust, and you know free cash flow went negative, but you can see that through the duration of this entire that same exact time period, while revenue growth was doing sixty percent per year. Look at what free cash flow was doing, you know, over 123% annualized over that time period. So this is the clearest example of not just growth at the revenue line, but increasing operating leverage, because we see a, a number that's, you know, below re revenue, such as free cash flow, growing at a rate that's faster than revenue growth. So again, that's evidence that there is the presence of, of, of massive operating leverage. And they continue to do that throughout their entire history, you know, even post 2007. So these are all examples. And then the third example, which I, would, I believe is just as important, if not, you know, more important than the others, is, you know, the return on assets. And you can see that although return on assets 
is being calculated in this chart in the traditional definition, which is using net income over total assets. You can see that although the number was negative, right, because we saw that they were, you know, gener generating losses, you can see that the trend was very, very clear. It was moving in the direction that we would want to see it. So this to me are, is the trifecta of picking winners within, within the space of unprofitability. Even though the company was unprofitable, they showed revenue growth, they showed evidence of operating leverage, and they show a very favorable trend of improving and increasing returns on capital, such as this return on assets. So that's the trifecta that you would want to see for you know, companies that will eventually um, prove out to be profitable. The same exact thing applies to Tesla. Since inception has been unprofitable. But if I were to switch this chart over and just look at you know, the history, you can see here that they were you know, incredibly unprofitable since inception. You can see the ROA was you know, negative 51%. So obviously that's a very, very deeply negative number to begin with. But you can see that since then, they've really cut that loss down tremendously and now have actually flipped to profitability. And you can see this number has now finally flipped um, positive and they just actually reported you know, earnings yesterday. Um, and if you looked at it, you know, the numbers were, were, were you know, fantastic. It grew revenue faster than growing earn, uh, you know, expenses. So again, that's evidence of operating leverage, which we can see in another chart you know, if I were to look at the same exact thing as what we just did for Amazon, you can see that, you know, the, the least squares of revenue growth over this entire time period is, you know, almost 82%. And the least squares growth in, you know, other factors is something even better than that. Um, and we can go through these different examples here. EBITDA growth doesn't seem to be it, but other numbers, perhaps uh, the net income line, has been growing even faster um, on a annualized, you know, least squares basis. And yes, and there we go with cash flow, for example. So it's different for each company, since every company has its own set of challenges, has its own unique circumstances. Obviously, Tesla is a heavy manufacturing company. Amazon is uh, not as involved in manufacturing, but they still do have a lot of physical plant property and equipment. But again, it's, it takes a little bit of experimentation to really find the number that really matters for that company. And so you can see here that, you know, revenue growth has been a blistering 82% for Tesla. So that satisfies, you know, criteria number one. Now you can see that cash flow growth over the same time period has been in far in excess of revenue growth, you know, at 252% annualized. And the third number, which is what we wanted to see is evidence of increasing uh, returns on assets. And you can see that here very clearly. And now it's flipped positive, you know, to 1%. And I believe that's going to continue, you know, to grow as they scale, um, you know, the business even further. So again, this is, you know, another example of a company that was unprofitable, but exhibited the characteristics that you would want to see um, to see a company that can one day become profitable and earn very attractive returns on capital. Let's take a, a little bit more of a recent example. We have Uber. Uber has much less operating history, but you can see here that even with Uber, we see uh, an example of very, very large losses, but the number on the return on assets has been trending in the, in the right direction. That we want to see. Still very deeply negative, but the number has been growing in, in the right direction that we want to see. We can see the same exact thing with, with, um, you know, with revenue growth. I'm going to switch over to the financials to kind of show you a different way to get the same exact uh, information. So if we go to financials here, and go to the income statement under the summary standardized section. We can see here that you know revenue growth is actually down year over year. We can see over the last four quarters, 
um, has been down about 3.4%. Obviously, the COVID environment has hit them pretty hard. But we can see that from 2018 to 2019, you know, revenue growth, you know, was at about 25%. But look at what EBITDA is doing here. If we go further down um, on the uh, the income statement, although EBITDA is still negative, right? You can see that there is a, a much bigger rate of improvement. So that is a little bit of a tidbit to tell you that maybe there is uh, evidence of operating leverage. We saw a growth in revenue of 25% year over year, and then a decline from a trailing four quarters basis over the annual number of 2019. But we see that there is a much, much more promising um, rate of improvement at a much lower um, you know, line, profit line item on the income statement. And that is you know, a trimming of the EBITDA loss from a, a massively negative $8 billion to a still you know, um, you know, concerning $2.3 billion loss, but that rate of improvement is dramatic, you know, at 70%. So maybe, um, and it's still probably a little premature to say this, but maybe that is evidence that there is scalability here, that they do have high fixed costs, that if Uber can continue to scale that revenue growth a little bit further, that, you know, there is potential that EBITDA can then flip positive and again, EBITDA is a leading indicator of net income growth. Ultimately, you know, this everything that I'm talking about here, it's not to say that earnings per share is not important. Of course, it's important. It's the most it's perhaps the most important number uh, to look at other than perhaps free cash flow. But what we want to see is evidence of underlying financial trends that can help you predict whether you know, the earnings can flip to profitability at some point in time. And typically what happens is EBITDA, um, you know, flips positive before, you know, net income does. And for some reason, unfortunately, not enough investors out there look at these numbers a little bit closely to be able to predict whether that in net income line can flip to profitability. So this could potentially give you a little bit of an edge you know, ahead of other investors that look at just the headline number that you see flashing on uh, throughout financial media. So again, we see revenue growth um, with the exception of right now during this COVID environment, you know, during this COVID shutdown environment. Um, but we see evidence that that EBITDA is being trimmed, that EBITDA loss is being trimmed. Um, also, for a lot of these larger companies, we do collect lots of estimates from across the street. So if I were to go over here to this growth in margin two view, um, we can see uh, what analysts are predicting as far as revenue growth. And you can see down here at the bottom that, you know, for 2020, we see a big loss in, um, or in revenue growth year over year at, you know, 51%. Um, but we see a return to growth in 2021 and beyond of, you know, 43% and 28% year over year. So that's really good to see that there is revenue growth. So again, that satisfies the first criteria that we saw. And then you can see down here at the bottom, earnings per share growth, even though it's negative, um, we see that you know analysts are expecting growth um, in excess of that revenue growth. So we see that 63% revenue or, or earnings growth and 58% earnings growth year over year. So again, that is another sign that there is evidence of potential operating leverage. We see, you know, at the net income line, and this is net adjusted net income, by the way, this is earnings before non-recurring items. So this is our adjusted net income. And even though it's forecast to be negative, um, we still see that there is evidence that um, analysts are expecting them to grow that you know that net income line or at least trim that loss at a rate greater than the rate that revenues are rising so again these are all little tidbits that you can pick up to um, essentially suggest whether or not there is evidence of operating leverage and so far you know with these two data points that we just saw with ebitda growing faster and in this case 
forecast net income to be growing faster than revenue growth. So perhaps, you know, there is evidence of operating leverage. And then lastly, you know, what is return on assets doing? Again, um, it's still negative, but you see that there is a positive trend developing here that um, although the, the number is still negative 16%, it's moving in the direction that we would want it to see. So again, this is another example of Uber potentially being, you know, a, um, you know, an, an investment candidate, despite the fact that they have very large uh, losses right now. So is there evidence of revenue growth? Yes. Is there evidence of operating leverage? Perhaps. Um, and is there evidence of increasing returns on capital? I would say so. So again, Uber seems to be a, a company that satisfies all three criteria. And lastly, uh, as an example that I definitely wanted to um, talk about um, is Snowflake. Snowflake is a recent, a very recent IPO, and it's been all over the financial media um, as a company that uh, was brought public through the SPAC. And uh, the SPAC is, um, you know, long story short, it's a reverse, it's essentially it's a reverse merger. It's a new way of companies going public where a holding company essentially merges with the private entity that used to be uh, the company Snowflake and therefore it goes public in that manner. For all practical purposes, it doesn't really make any difference for investors. Ultimately, what we want to see as an investor is what are the underlying financial trends you know of the company and i just brought up the s1 filing um that they filed with the with the sec as a little bit of a better way to understand it because they obviously report the numbers a little bit differently so in this case because it's such a brand new company um i i'm just gonna re reference the uh the s1 filing as our way of walking through these three key financial trends that I mentioned. So I here is their, their S1 filing, and you can see some of the things that they um, you know that they highlight as you know what their you know key metrics are or their key performance indicators are, their KPIs. You can see revenue growth right here at 121%, very strong retention rate, um, you know, total customers. Um, and then here is that chart of revenue growth, and you can see that their total quarterly revenue, again, here is, uh, you know, satisfaction of the first criteria that we talked about is, you know, increasing revenue growth, which again is talking about increasing adoption of their services that they offer. But what else, what about the other ones? Is there evidence of, you know, um, is there evidence of uh, increasing operating leverage? Because again, Snowflake is a company that does not have profitability right now. Um, in fact, they rep they report fairly large losses, and you can see here that in 2019 they reported a loss of 178 million, and in 2020 um, that loss actually increased um, almost doubled to about uh, 348 million. So we see revenue growth here has been very, very strong. It's more than doubled year over year. So that's that's phenomenal. But you know, the net loss has actually increased um, by more than that. So what is the evidence of operating leverage? Is there any? And I would say that there is, because you can see right off the bat that you know revenue growth has more than doubled. But look what happened to gross profit. You can see that gross profit um, has you know increased by almost three times from about 45 you know million dollars to about 150 million dollars so gross profit has grown at a rate faster than revenue growth so what does that mean although if you go further down you know the the the, the line item here you don't really see that you know show up just yet but like i said it depends on the stage of the company whether it's the operating income line or in this case, operating loss line, whether it's at the EBITDA line or at the gross profit line. And because gross profit has shown a better growth rate than even revenue growth, you can see that because that has, has been the case, there is some evidence that there is operating leverage. Um, 
because if we know a little bit about what goes into that cost of revenue, there is a fixed component, a fixed cost component of you know the cost of revenue. And that's how you can see that when revenues scale, you know, if there is a large, you know, fixed cost component to the cost of revenue, then gross profit can grow at a rate faster than revenue growth. And that's exactly what you would want to see as evidence of operating leverage. And in this case, we see that right here that yes, there is potential that Snowflake does have, um, you know, revenue growth or uh, operating leverage. And then the third point is, is there evidence of increasing uh, return on assets? You know, are they spending a lot to achieve this revenue growth? You know, so revenue growth is great. Like I said before, um, operating leverage is great, but if it requires lots and lots of capital spending, then um, perhaps um, that's not, you know, the best investment to, to be looking at. So is, is, is there evidence of increasing return on assets? So if I go down a, a little bit further to look at their, their balance sheet, we can see um, here, um, as soon as I find their balance sheet here, there it is, okay, sorry about that. So total assets right here, um, we saw um, revenue growth more than double and we saw gross profit growth almost triple. But look at what happened to total assets here. Total assets didn't double at all. In fact, it grew about, you know, by about 35 to 40%, um, you know, maybe 50%, just looking at the rough math. So again, we see evidence of revenue growth and gross profit growth exceeding the growth in total assets. So again, these are all very favorable numbers to be looking at. Um, so going back to the original, you know, PowerPoint presentation, you know, we see that, you know, all four of these companies that we looked at here are, or have been, um, unprofitable at one point or another in their life. But we see that throughout that entire time, there's evidence of revenue growth, which, you know, is an example of mark increasing market adoption. We see evidence of operating leverage which means that something below the revenue line is growing faster than revenue, okay? And then we see evidence of increasing returns on capital um, using this return on assets number. And again, depending on what stage of the company, what stage of life the company is in, um, there's many different ways to measure that return on assets. The traditional calculation may not be the right one, although it is the case, for um, for uh, Amazon and even Tesla, um, it's not the case for Snowflake. In that case, you want to use the, the the asset turnover ratio, or better yet, the gross profit to total assets uh, ratio to look at and and track whether or not this number is increasing over time. So hopefully, this presentation was helpful. Um, we have a lot of this data. In fact, we have all of this data in ZRS. And so we um, allow, you know, not just looking at this in chart form, but also to look at it in spreadsheet form. So if you have, um, you know, any spreadsheet that you would like to look at or any companies that you would like to uh, specifically look at and to walk through any of these numbers, um, please definitely feel free to reach out to us um, at uh, ZRS at zax.com. Once again, ZRS at zax.com. And I'd be happy to, to walk through any company that you would want to take a look at in further detail um, using this overall framework um, of growth, um, operating leverage, and return on assets. So hopefully this uh, overall presentation was helpful. Again, any questions, please do shoot that out to ZRS at zax.com. And uh, again, thank you for attending and uh, hope to see you very shortly on uh, the next uh, Lunch and Learn webinar series. Thanks everyone, have a good day.